All right, you're good. What's up and welcome to the EFIS. I'm Justin Leisure. And Zach Hummel is back this week after – it's been a couple podcasts now you haven't been on, but what's up, Zach? Nothing much, man. Nothing much. Uh, glad to be back on the MLB podcast and uh, looking to talk some baseball. Yeah, I feel like uh, this is the one podcast we have trouble kind of assembling the same crew for every single uh, every single one. But, um, yeah, for the most part, it's been like me, or, me and you or me and Nate, uh, me and Salim. Or like you and Nate. So it's been kind of all over the place. But yeah, this week it's me and Zach. It's the regular duo. Um, yeah. and we're back at it. So since you haven't been on, you haven't been able to address uh, your boy Trevor Story's injury, his season-ending injury. Um, so I, I'm going to let you go off about him because you haven't really had the chance to, uh, to talk about that. So let's hear it. Yeah, I mean, that injury was – because he was actually, you know – the thing people talk about with stories, like he's not an average hitter. He was hitting 272, and that average was rising. Um, and he went through a little lull after the All-Star break, but he started picking it back up with home runs and RBIs. And that, you know, they looked good after the All-Star break. Um, they even got to almost 500 at one point. Right. And it's just disappointing because I think he was working his way up to being, you know, the NL Rookie of the Year. Um so we'll just have to wait till next season. And I think that Rockies team led by him and Arenado are going to be legit playoff contenders. If they just get a little bit of pitching, you know, people, people knew a little bit about Trevor story next year, next year, this year. I mean, next year he'll, he'll, he'll make the headlines. Like he's going to be uh, maybe top 10 player in the league, just at the numbers he put up this year. If he can even do, you know, raise his average a little, same home run, same RBIs. He was on pace for so many, so many good stats. So, you know, it's just sad to see him go down uh, early this season because I, I actually wanted to see what kind of numbers he would end up with at the end of the season because he's, you know, he's my favorite player. So just a yeah. little disappointing. Yeah, I agree. I actually kind of wanted to see him finish the season healthy. I mean, obviously we all want to see him fi- finish the season healthy, but since he was kind of a storyline for the website, I wanted to see, uh, you know, what he'd finish with. And he would definitely be in the running for NL Rookie of the Year along with like Corey Seager. So uh, another shortstop in the National League West. So I, I thought that would be a kind of cool storyline to see. So, yeah, it's definitely sad. Um, as for the Rockies as a team, I I mean, that lineup, even without Story, I love it. I mean, LeMayhew, you got Arenado. With Story in the lineup, obviously it's ideal. But then you got, like, David Dahl, who's been picking it up, that uh, yeah. rookie who's been, I think, the past, like, 20 games, he's hit in, like, 18 of them. So. Yeah. Um, so that whole lineup's killing it, but yeah, it's the same old story with the Rockies. They need that pitching. Um, we're starting to see them improve, I guess you could say. Like, this is a stepping stone year. Next year, I'm very, very interested to see what direction they head in, whether it's kind of, um, same old thing as this, same thing as this year, where the offense is outstanding and the pitching's, meh, like, very, pr- I'd, I'd say their, their pitching's been pretty, it's better than it usually is, but it's still pretty shitty. Like, it needs improvement. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I agree with you all around on that. I, I'm definitely – I mean, you know I wasn't on the story bandwagon to start the year, but as – I mean, you can't deny stats as the year goes on. And while the strikeout numbers were high, I think, uh, I think you just got to hand it to him. He, he had uh, the home run totals. He had the, you know, the slugging. He, he was a good shortstop. You know what I mean? He wasn't just an offensive player. So, uh, so any guy like that, when you see him go down yeah. – it sucks, but I'm definitely looking forward to seeing him play next year. Yeah, next year, like you said, it'll definitely be make it or break it year for the Rockies. Um, you know, even today, it's just like they put up seven runs in the first standing against the Cubs. Like, they have an offense that can just, you know, almost outduel every offense in the league. And playing in that ballpark, if they can just get, you know, one iota of pitching, I think they're a playoff team. Because the NL West seems like the Dodgers aren't that consistent and the Giants are sort of on the decline. So, you know, next year will be huge for the Rockies. Definitely make it or break it year, and see if Trevor Story can handle it and you know follow it up with a great sophomore campaign. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of uh, you know, seeing it's sad to see guys go down. Prince Fielder, he went down due to an injury, um, his second neck surgery, and yeah. you know that's that's just tough. I mean, Prince Fielder was only 31 years old. He had a few years left in him. He's a great hitter. He was actually the comeback player of the year last year, and. Um, it was really sad. That whole press conference, everything about it was just very, very sad. Uh, what do you have to think? What do you have to say about Prince Fielder? Uh, I've never been a big fan of Prince Fielder, to be honest, because I just think he's just, you know, usually comes out of 
camp out of shape and right. overweight. So I don't have a ton of like sympathy for him. He was obviously a great hitter, um, you know, great power hitter. And I think he gets a little more maybe pub than most people because of his, you know, his dad was a great player too. But right. yeah, that press conference was sad. I mean, a neck injury, um, definitely something you don't want to be messing around with. No, but definitely not. I think it might be karma coming back to bite him for just being out of shape and a fat slug like half his career. So definitely that might be a hot be. take, but I just think like maybe if you kept yourself in better shape, your neck wouldn't kill you and you wouldn't be retiring at 31. I don't know. Right. Who knows? That definitely could have something to do with it for sure. Uh, I thought the one cool thing, even though it's like the whole story is pretty sad, how his career was definitely cut short, but I thought the one cool thing was that he finished with the same exact amount of homers as his dad, Cecil Fielder. So that was one, I guess, I don't want to call it a positive storyline, but it was kind of a cool little stat to leave off of. Um, I guess if you're going to spin it in a positive way, that would be it. But it's like, I, I, that's pretty tough just to see a guy like him go down with that sort of injury. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, if you told me at the beginning of the career he would end up with the same runs as dad, I'd tell you, well, this guy is going to hit 30 a year for like 10 years. So right. he would end up more with his dad. So it definitely is sad that he didn't maybe reach his full potential in that sense. Right. I would have thought he'd end up with like 450 or so, probably in that area by the end of his career, you know, because yeah. if he didn't have these neck injuries, he'd be in the league for probably another like six years, seven years because he'd be just DH and right, whatnot. Right. He'd just DH. So it wouldn't matter at all. Um, yeah. yeah. That's, that's sad. Uh, A-Rod, he also maybe played in his last game. We don't know for sure. It's, you never it's know what they run. You really don't know, but uh, he played his at least his last game as a Yankee. And then there were those rumors swirling that maybe he'd go to the Marlins. That didn't go through. Uh, obviously, there's still a chance that maybe that gets worked out in the future. But as of right now, Arod is staying put. He he put word out via a publicist that he's not going. He's not playing baseball this year for the rest of the season. So uh, we probably won't see Arod uh, in a baseball uniform for the rest of the season. But uh, that means I'm looking forward to seeing him do some stuff in the booth. Uh, I, I thought I was really impressed when he did it last year during the playoffs. So uh, I'd like to see A-Rod. That's when A-Rod started winning me over. So, Yeah, he's the perfect talking head. You know, he's a good-looking guy who's well-spoken. So he's, you know, perfect choice to be in the booth. Um, he, I, I love him in that Fox booth when they have Pete Rose and then they have A-Rod. So it's kind of right. like the good guy oh, and the bad awesome. guy, I guess. Yeah, One guy that wants to be loved by everyone and Pete Rose could give two shits. But I, I think the Yankees didn't handle this that, that great because, you know, I grew up on A-Rod. You know, the Red Sox almost got him in that uh, doc they did. So um, you you find out how close the Red Sox really were to getting A-Rod and you wonder how that would have changed everything. But, uh, yeah, he had a great career, and I just think the Yankees handled it crappy down the stretch. You know, we'll talk about Teixeira retiring, but he was yeah. putting up better numbers than Teixeira, but Girardi was still playing Teixeira every day. You know, I know – all these Yankees, you know, they have a lot of good young players coming up, like Judge and Sanchez, who we now see are, you know, legit. Yeah, Gary players. Sanchez is slugging. slugging. Yeah, he's he's mashing the ball. But yeah. uh, I just think A-Rod deserves better. Like, I think he deserves to finish this, the season with the team. I know, you know, maybe it was a joint decision, but I think the Yankees kind of didn't handle it that great and kind of pushed him out in the end. Yeah, he definitely did. And you saw Girardi, he had that press conference after his final game where he kind of broke down crying. Uh, so he, he knew he screwed up. You know, I, he, he didn't really play it the right way. I think the whole the whole thing happened really fast, too. It was like one second the news broke that A-Rod uh, plans on retiring and might get released. The next second he's playing in his final game. And he didn't really get the playing time that he kind of deserved in his final week uh, in the league. So that was a little strange. But, uh, yeah, Girardi, the way he handled the entire thing kind of sucked. And I think he knew it's, he, that it sucked. And then you just uh, touched on Teixeira, who is also retiring. Uh, I saw a few people debate whether he's a Hall of Famer or not. I don't think so at all. I mean, he was an outstanding hitter, an outstanding fielder, but he's not Hall of Fame level. Like, if you're going to start throwing guys like Teixeira in the Hall of Fame, there's so many guys from the past that you have to, you would have to put in there too just because, like, Teixeira, as great of a player he is, he was never, ever Hall of Fame caliber. Yeah, I agree. I don't think he's Hall of Fame at all. Um you know, Mark Teixeira, he's kind of had a weird career. He was definitely one of the better – whenever he's in the league, he's definitely one of the better switch hitting, you know, players, um, power to all fields and whatnot. Um, I think Yankee Stadium did definitely helped him out a little bit. But you look at his home run totals, he had 404. 
which is, you know, not great, but um, definitely up there. I mean, Soriano, he's p- kind of in the Alfonso Soriano, similar stats to him. Yeah. Um, he did play a great first base, though. Uh, definitely there every year in the gold glove uh, race. But, yeah, definitely not a Hall of Famer. And another guy that the Red Sox almost got that would have – we would have liked to right. see uh, if he, if he uh, ended up winning those World Series with Teixeira at the same time. Right. I feel as though if Teixeira didn't get hurt so often, maybe you'd be able to make an argument for Hall of Fame, depending on the stats he put up in that time where he was healthy. But, again, he's the stats, the, the way things are now, is he's not. He's just not a Hall of Famer. I don't see how you can form a valid argument that he is. Uh, fantastic player. Um but that's pretty much all there is to that. Going back to the A-Rod thing for a sec with the Marlins, uh, that's the whole reason he was rumored to go there is because Giancarlo Stanton, uh, he's out for the rest of the year, which is really that, – that's – I mean, this whole – I feel like this whole pa- month or so, this past month has just been filled with devastating injuries and just retirements. Like, very strange yeah. month in baseball. Uh, but, yeah, yeah, Stanton, left groin injury, out for the year, which is very, very unfortunate for the Marlins – because they were in the hunt, at least in the wild card. And now to see a guy like Stanton go down, that's, that sucks pretty badly, especially when he was heating up. Yeah, he was definitely heating up, which is the thing that makes it even more sad. Um, he was hitting pretty well down the stretch, and he was hitting more of the opposite field, which I think kind of helped him get out of that low streak he was in. But, you know, they, they were without Stanton, but they, they beat – they uh, won the last three versus the Pirates – um, so they're actually playing decently. They just need their pitch. If they're pitching, you know, pitches to their ability, they need them to pitch over their ability because their ability is not great, but they're only a game and a half back in the wild card, but they do have to chase teams like St. Louis, San Francisco. So I don't think they have a chance. Um, it just seems like this Miami team similar to Colorado next year will be a make it or break it year for them. They do have a little more pitching than the Rockies, but I think the Rockies yeah. have a better order, but if you have a whole season with D. Gordon, Yelich, Echeverria, uh, Ozuna, and Stanton, and Martin Prado, who I think is one of the most underrated players in the MLB, um, that's a lineup that I think not couldn't challenge the Nationals, but definitely should be in a wild card spot next year. I'm interested for sure how they would do, or how they would have done, I should say, if Giancarlo Stanton played out of his mind starting the beginning of the season. I Stanton's season his first half of, of the season was dreadful and they're nine games out of the NL East, which I know, I mean, nine games out, you don't, you don't want to be nine games out of your division, but for the Marlins, a second place team, that's an accomplishment for them. And I'm interested to see if Stanton, you know, if he played up to his caliber in the first half of the year, you know, what would the standings look like right now? Um, yeah. pro- it, it would probably be a, a major difference. The Marlins would probably be contenders, maybe, maybe even lead the wild card right now. So um, it's again, it's unfortunate Stanton went down because now the Marlins probably aren't going to have a chance to compete in that wild card, uh, especially with the likes of you know the Dodgers and the Cardinals and the Pirates. Uh, right now, I think it's the it's the Dodgers leading the wild card. I'm not 100 percent sure in that. I'm not. Yeah, they're, t- they're tied with the Giants right now. Okay, all right, oh, well, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So I don't see the Marlins competing with them. Maybe next year when they have their shit together, you know, they have guys healthy. Whether they can stay healthy all year, I mean, obviously that's that's something you just got to worry about. But um, they're one of those teams that we have said in the past, like the past few years, we've said, oh, maybe the Marlins this year, maybe the Marlins this year. Yeah. Next year is a year where you can say that with a straight face. Uh, th- this year is one of those years where, like, come on, we say that every year. But next year, it's like seriously, the Marlins could be a formidable opponent. Opponent. Yeah, D. Gordon hurt them too, missing the, the first uh, what was it, sixty right. games for PED. So. You know, maybe they get A Rod as one of the coaches, and they have A Rod Bonds down there. That would so, be something else. That'd be a great, that'd be a great clubhouse to be in with all those guys. And Miami's yeah. a great city, so yeah, next year is definitely one to watch out for the Marlins. Definitely yeah. make it or break it year again. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so we can move on to Mookie Betts, who has been unbelievable lately. MVP candidate all of a sudden for, sure, uh, for the yeah. Boston Red Sox, and. He hit three home runs in a game again, which I think he's the only other – the only Red Sox player to do that was Ted Williams, I believe. Um, I think that was the stat. So that's impressive yeah. by itself. But as a whole, Betts has been on fire. Um, I haven't – I'll admit, I haven't watched a ton of Red Sox baseball lately, so I've been kind of watching just like the highlights. 
But I feel like in every single uh, highlight that I watch, it's Mookie Betts carrying the team. And now you look, and the Boston Red Sox are half game out of first behind the Blue Jays. So uh, what do you think of Betts? Yeah, I definitely think he's an MVP candidate. Um, I think when he came up, we all thought he was going to be, you know, a guy with speed, a singles and doubles hitter. Definitely. A leadoff guy, like, in front of Pedroia. But he's really – He's really got the power, man. He's got, like, such a compact to-the-ball swing. Um, I still think he needs to work on his plate discipline a little bit. He swings at some bad pitches sometimes. But when he connects, I mean, he cracks the ball. And that, that game, again, he loves hitting at Camden Yards. That game where he hit three home runs. He was definitely carrying the Red Sox the past, you know, week or two. I mean, his last 15 games, I have it here, he's got six home runs, 18 RBIs. He's hitting almost 400. That's, that's unbelievable. That's MVP-like numbers. So, and this is a time where you, you make a name for yourself when your teams, like you said, they're just behind the Blue Jays. They're, they got people chasing down their ass in the wild card like Seattle. Um, so you need, you're going to need that from Mookie Betts um, because some of the other Red Sox have kind of been slumping a little bit, like JBJ, uh, a couple other guys, Hanley. So you, Betts has definitely been carrying them. and They've needed it because their pitching you know, has always been suspect this whole season. The one thing I've noticed about this Red Sox lineup is if one – major guy is struggling and the next guy steps up right yeah. now it seems like that guy struggling is like xander bogarts for for example yeah mookie, I betts, him, yeah mookie betts is stepping up in his place and is killing it and when xander comes back if mookie's still producing anything close to what he's doing now the red sox could easily overtake the blue jays in this division um and you're starting to see the orioles slip a little bit too which we'll get to a little bit they're two and a half games back yeah, the their division. pitching sucks. It's bad. You knew all along that this Orioles pitching staff couldn't really uh, keep up what they've been doing all season long. They just they don't have the guys that even the Red Sox have. I mean, the Red Sox rotation's been iffy all year too, but they have some go-to guys. Like you, you see, Porcello might even be an. You can make an argument that he's a Cy Young candidate this year. So yeah, uh, for sure. Orioles. I mean, I guess you could. If you really wanted to reach, you could say Chris Tillman's a Cy Young candidate. I don't personally think so, um, but he's leading that rotation. But name another guy in that rotation who's really going to step up when in this second half, or the, I should say this last month of the season. You really can't. So Yeah, I think, I think it's going to be down to the Blue Jays and the Red Sox because the Orioles, if their offense doesn't score like five to six a game, they have no shot. Like They just, they just put out the shittiest pitching every – like I think – the Astros have been killing them in this series lately, too. They've scored over 10 runs in the first two games. So they, they last night I saw they put out Ubaldo Jimenez gave up, like, four runs. This guy, Despagne, gave up four runs. And they brought Travis Wilson, who gave up, like, four runs. So they just have guys that give up the long ball. And in Camden Yards, if you don't have good pitching, you know, the ball flies out of there. And you can, you can get behind quickly. And if you don't, your offense has an off night, you have no shot. I definitely like the Blue Jays and the Red Sox to be there at the end you know, fighting for the division title. Yeah, I agree. Those are the two teams I've said all along that are going to be at the top of the AL East. I never saw the Orioles keeping that pace, like I said, uh, all season long. And, um, again, the big reason why the Red Sox are up there is because guys like Mookie Betts are stepping up and being MVP-like candidates. And another MVP candidate, Jose Altuve, uh, he might be the guy who I, – I think he will be the guy who wins the MVP when it's all said and done this season – uh, he got his 1,000th hit of his career, which I thought that happened pretty fast. I feel like he – I think he's – I don't know if I'm making this up. I think he might be the second or third quickest to that, to 1,000 hits. So, he's only 26, so it makes sense. I think – I think. I hope I'm not making that up, but I thought I heard that so, somewhere that he's like the second or third, and I think Ichiro was the quickest. But uh, Altuve is hitting 366 right now, cruising, cruising towards another batting title. Uh, his on-base percentage is, I believe, five, 429, and he's slugging 581, which is right behind David Ortiz for the lead in the AL. A David yeah. or just think of those guys next to each other. A huge dude like David Ortiz is leading in slugging. Second place is little 5'6", Jose Altuve. So yeah. that's, that's unbelievable. What are your thoughts on Jose Altuve? Yeah, he's a great player. Uh, if people caught, like, how I compared backyard baseball players to MLB players, yeah. and obviously Altuve is the perfect Pablo Sanchez. He's got power. He hit, He's a doubles machine. You know, as I said, Mookie Betts' his last 15 games, Altuve is hitting 415 with, like, 635 slugging, and his on-base percentage is, you know, 456. 
that's crazy. Like he's almost on base every other time he's up at the dish. Yeah. And and this Orioles series has really been, you know, one of those breakout parties because you, you know, you you play a lot in the, the AL Central, AL West. I don't get a lot of time to like watch those games, but if right. you're on the East Coast, I can see the highlights. And he's been crushing the Orioles, going opposite field, hitting gap shots, stealing bases, and he plays a great second base. So he's definitely trying to pull the Astros out because they've definitely underwhelmed after making the playoffs last year. So. You know, I think the Astros need to make the playoffs if Altuve gets MVP because I actually like Mookie Betts a little more just because he has a little bit more power, which I think, you know, chicks dig the long ball, so do the that voters. That definitely sways voters, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so I would put Betts over him, but, you know, what he's doing, he's definitely probably the best hitter in the league at this point. Yeah, I agree. And uh, I'd say probably the top AL MVP candidates at this point in time are probably Altuve, Betts, Donaldson, Trout, and you can maybe make an argument for, uh, like, Mark Trumbo simply because of the amount of homers he has. I think he has 36 now or something like that. So um, the guys yeah. who hit – the guy who leads the league in homers always gets a decent amount of votes. But those are probably the main guys right now. And I feel like I've changed my MVP pick literally every month this season. I think at first I said Trout, and then I said Donaldson, and now I'm saying Altuve. Maybe a month from now I'll be saying Betts. So we'll, yeah. we'll see how the rest of the season goes. Um, how do you think the rest of the season is going to pan out? I feel like this is a question that we ask every podcast since it's every two weeks. But now we're at the point where there's only about 40 games left uh, until the postseason. So we're really getting to that point. By the time we record the next podcast, it's going to be you know, almost the end of the season. It's going to be mid-September. So uh, what do you think? Yeah, I think the National League is a lot more clear-cut. Like I think the Nationals obviously are going to win the East. The yeah. Cubs have been a fucking train all year. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they've struggled a little lately, but they, they're, they're back on track. Um, Dodgers and Giants, one of those teams will win the division. One will be in the wild card. I like the Giants to win their division. I think the Dodgers will play the wild card. And like we said earlier with Miami, I mean, they're the closest contender to getting the Cardinals for that second wild card. I don't see Pittsburgh and the Mets have totally, you know, fell, fallen back. Um, they got Cespedes yeah. back, but their pitching has been absolutely terrible. So I just No see one would that. expect that either. That their match yeah. would be terrible. It's been all season. It's been pretty bad. Yeah, their bullpen and middle relief have been terrible. So if the top guys aren't good, you know, yeah. they really don't have a lie after that. So that's how I see the National League playing out. I actually completely agree with that. Um, and in that wild card game, I'll probably, I'd probably say it'll be Cardinals versus the Dodgers, which I think that's a pretty good wild card game too, given the postseason history those two teams have against each yeah. other. And you know, I mean, if he's healthy, I don't know what the deal is with Kershaw. But if Kershaw is going to be thrown in that game, if he is, and then if he blows it again to the Cardinals, man, uh, that would be something else. Now, yeah, I just don't know if the Cardinals have like a top end of the end, top of the line starter. Like Wainwright gets, he he's had a bad season. I don't know who yeah. they start in that game. Yeah, that's a tough choice. Um, I, I'd be interested to see who they throw in there too. Uh, I I mean personally, I think the Dodgers would win that game. But uh, if, like I said, if Kershaw starts and if he blows it again, that's when you. We really got to start talking about Kershaw um, not being – I mean, we already are, have talked about Kershaw not performing in the postseason, but yeah. that's what like – Exactly. He'll be like LeBron. Best player, but he can't do it in the playoffs. Yeah. And then, uh, like you said, the American League is kind of a shit show right now. Uh, I'll, you know what? I don't want to be a homer when I say this, but I do think the Red Sox are going to take the AL East. I just think that the pitching is starting to figure it out. I like Pomeranz a lot. He's starting to show his true colors. Uh, Porcello has been performing. I, I believe in Price. I really do. Uh, as for the other guys, things can get a little iffy, but um, I like the Red Sox because of the combination of their pitchers who have been proving themselves and that lineup, uh, especially if guys like Bogart start figuring it out. Uh, in the Central, I like the Indians. I don't think the Indians are going to slow down. Um, they, they're 71 and 51 right now, which is – I, beginning of the season, I would have never expected that from the Indians, but they've been killing it. Uh, AL West, I like the Rangers. And the Mariners, I said at the beginning of the year that they were going to make some noise this year. And uh, we, we both said that they're the team every year. Everyone's like, oh, look out for the Mariners, and nothing ever happens. This is the year they're starting to make some noise. Uh, they could make a wild card run, so uh, watch out for them. But, yeah, I think it's going to be Red Sox, Indians, Rangers for – um, division winners in the wild card game. I, I mean, I think I'm just going to have to go. I mean, I want every part of my being wants to pick the Astros in there, 
but I don't think they're going to be in it. I think I don't think they have what it takes this season. I'll probably go Blue Jays. I'll probably go Blue Jays Mariners. I don't think the Tigers going to make it either. So I think it'll be Blue Jays Mariners wild card game, and I'll I'll probably give that to. As much as I want to give it to the Mariners, I can't. I can't not give it to the Blue Jays. So I'll go. I'll go there. Yeah, I mean, I think the Blue Jays are going to end up winning the division just because I think their lineup's so good. And uh, if they get some head-to-heads versus the Red Sox, I do like Toronto. Um, if Boston just needs to get quality starts out of their starters, like if they can just go six or seven innings giving up three runs, I'd like our chances every night. But I just don't think they will down the stretch. So I, th- I have Boston in the wild card. Um, Toronto. When I get Cleveland, like you said, um, I love Jose Ramirez on their team. Yeah, um, he can just literally play anywhere, and he hit a huge home run the other night, and he hit another one today, today. to win them yeah. a game. Yeah, he's been great. I love watching him play in Texas. Um, if you go Darvish Hamels, that might be the best one-two combo in the AL, which is not saying a lot because neither of those guys really jump off the page right now. Yeah. But I mean, it is what it is. So I, I, I like Texas in the West, and then. In the wild card game, I like Boston hosting Seattle. So okay. that'll be a great game. Um, That'd be an interesting love, game, for yeah, sure. Yeah, I would like to see who Boston starts because I think Seattle will definitely start King Felix. Right. Um, who's kind I, of struggled a little bit this season, but we'll see. I think at this point, I mean, this whole season we've been thinking, we've been sort of panicking if that situation were to arise. Who the hell do we – who the hell – It's, it's Porcello. Porcello. At, yeah. at this point, it's clear cut. You throw Porcello out there. I've been saying Price all season long simply because he was supposed to be the guy. Uh, even in his latest starts, I thought he'd turn it around. He has not. I, like I said before, though, I still have hope that he will. It's just that at this point, it's so clear cut that Porcello's the guy you throw out there in that game, um, yeah. in which I, I, I trust Porcello now. I do. He, he, he's earned my trust the way he's performed all year. His last start was fantastic. So uh, unless he really sputters towards the end of the year, I think Porcello is the guy you threw out there. Yeah, and I don't think Price is like a dickhead like John Lackey would be if he didn't get to start right. that game. Like I think he knows. He said in the media that he's under been underperforming to his contract. But you you got we have to watch out for the Kansas City Royals. They're nine and one in their last ten. They have play a shitload of bad teams. They play Minnesota a lot and White Sox a lot coming in. Yeah, they're only four games out. I mean. They, they're, they just know how to win at this time of the year, so I would not keep them off the radar. And you know what pisses me off? Like, the Yankees are, are sort of having a down year by their standards. Yep. And they're like they're four and they're still over 500. And the Red Sox do. They're like 20 games under. So it seems like the Yankees can rebuild with still having a winning record, which kind of pisses me off. But, you know, it is what it is with that team. Yeah, I completely agree. Everyone keeps saying – everyone everyone keeps counting the Yankees out, and it's – you just shouldn't. You, I've, I think that's like a yearly thing. You just don't count the Yankees out. Six and a half games back isn't a lot. There's, I mean, there's a lot of games to be played. So if they go on a little hot streak, they got guys who can hit in that lineup. Um, you never know what could happen. Do I personally think they're going to be in the playoffs? No, but – Again, I wouldn't be completely shocked if they were. And as for the Royals, I'm looking at their, uh, their – I'm looking at the standings right now, and one thing that jumps off the page to me is that the Royals are 40-21 and 21 at home, and they're 24-39 and 39 on the road. So that's, yeah. that's a major, major discrepancy there. Uh, and I didn't even realize, as we were talking about standings and, like, and wild card picks and such – the Royals, if they sneak into these playoffs, I mean, I, I don't know how you can really pick against them at this point. They're so scrappy that this is their time of year. And yeah, they won again today. Yeah, I can totally see them get, sneaking their way into the playoffs and being just a little thorn in everyone's side when it comes down to uh, the end of September and October. Yeah, I definitely like I said, they they know how to win at this time of year. And Danny Duffy for them is eleven and one, won again today. So I just want to know your opinion. All right. So the Red let's yeah. say the Red Sox have a one run lead going into the seventh, eighth, and ninth. What what guys would you have pitching every inning out of the bullpen? Oh, fuck. If you had your perfect if you had your perfect world. Because I know there's been a lot of talk about Papelbon, but I don't think he'll come no. to the Red Sox. At this no, point. he won't. All right. Well Kimbrell scares the living shit out of me. So I don't think yeah. I want to throw him out there in a crucial, crucial situation. And the fact that I'm saying that actually makes me a little upset because, you know, we brought in guys like Price and Kimbrell 
to be the guys to count on this time, that time of year. And now we're scared to even throw them out there. So that part is unfortunate. Ziegler, yeah. maybe? I mean, I, I don't know. Well, starting, what, like, which innings are you referring to? Like seventh, eighth, and ninth. Like I would okay. go, I would go Barnes, Kimbrel, and, and if Kimbrel gets in trouble, Ziegler to close it out. Yeah. Because I just Kimbrel gets to a three-two count with almost every batter, and it's like, are they going to chase his slider? And it's so nerve-wracking because that's not a good way to close. Like you, when people hit Kimbrel, they hit it right on the barrel. Yeah. I like closers that like can get out while still letting the guy hit the ball. And Ziegler gets that a lot. He gets a lot of ground right. balls off. You know, stinker he throws. I agree with you. I would probably throw. I, I mean, I I'm not throwing Tazawa out there. Please don't throw Tazawa out yeah, there. Yeah, he got shelled time. again today. Yeah. yeah. So I, I I can't let that. And that's exactly what Farrell's gonna do too. Which I I already know how this wild. If this wild card game happens, I already know how the whole thing's gonna play out. It's gonna be a complete shit show from start to finish. We're gonna be yelling at the TV uh, at Farrell's managerial decisions. So you know, I I think seventh inning. I agree. Go Barnes. Eighth inning. I don't know. I think I'm throwing Ziegler out there. I think I throw Ziegler out there and I see what happens from there. I don't think I, I count on Kimbrell in that clutch of a situation. Uh, he's given me too many heart attacks this season. So um, in a game of that, you know, the guy, I don't want to be having heart attacks late in the game and for a game like that, you know? Yeah. Well, maybe even in the one game wild card, like they can throw Price or they could throw, you know, another one of the starters if they really need to get like a lefty out. They can have Price throw like two or three batters because it's a one game or go home. So you might as well. Yeah. I know it's all like hypothetical, but Kimbrel, you might as well just put him in for the ninth and let him just gas himself out for like twenty to twenty-five pitches and hope yeah. he gets out of it at that point. Yeah, that's a tough situation for sure. I'd, I'd, I'm definitely interested to see how Farrell will handle that if. Um, if that situation arises. The only reason I bring it up is because the Mariners have, like, a lights-out bullpen. Like, they have guys throwing, like, 100, and their closer is, like, this Diaz guy who's disgusting. So yeah. if it gets into the bullpen, I almost like the Mariners more if fruition, which it may Wouldn't that be ironic, though, if uh, if the Mariners beat the Red Sox in the wild card game and it came down to bullpens with Carson Smith injured? Yeah, he's definitely – like, he just – I haven't really seen him pitch that much, and he's still cost the Red Sox like 10 games this year just by being injured. So. I know. It's so unfortunate. And that guy has nasty stuff too. If I mean, if he were – if we were to face the – he's an ex-Mariner. So if the Red Sox were to face the yeah. Mariners and not have Carson Smith available in the bullpen to shut them down and they end up losing due to that, that's something else. That's that's a storyline that, uh, that you know, that would really be, in, be very unfortunate for the Red Sox for that whole thing to play out that way. Yeah, I mean, we only gave up Wade Miley in that deal, yeah. so and he's not—he's on the Orioles giving up so many runs. So, <laughs> yeah, I know, good riddance to hit that guy. Uh, I think that pretty much wraps everything up. Uh, so I'm gonna just end this with a little plug here. We got a couple shows on iTunes now. We got Anything Goes, our comedy slash pop culture podcast, which is now on iTunes. So if you search Anything Goes, actually, it's—I think it's the first one that comes up. So check that out. Subscribe. Leave us a nice little review. Zach, your podcast, your NBA podcast with Cole, the Euro Step is now on iTunes. So if you yep. search the Euro Step, I believe that's also the first one that comes up. So again, it's just good SEO, smart SEO, and exactly. Oh, our yeah, it's fantastic. So just go subscribe to that, leave a nice review for that, because the more nice reviews we get, uh, the more popular these podcasts have a chance of getting. Uh, and we we obviously plan on getting this one on there soon. It's just you have to jump through hoops to get things on iTunes. So uh, we're, we're mm-hmm. going to do that. I'm um, going to jump through those hoops, get the EFIS on iTunes. Then uh, in the future, we plan on having an NFL podcast for the season, which I'm very excited about, and a fantasy podcast. And we'll keep you up to date on that. And, uh, of course, we're getting everything on iTunes. So I can't stress that enough. Be sure to check Ledge Radio out on iTunes. Uh, Zach, if you got anything else, I think we're no gonna- man, just check out the podcast. I think we do some good stuff. I think we all know what we're talking about, so definitely informative stuff. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think it's good that we're getting into the uh, whole podcasting game finally and getting everything on iTunes. I think that's been the goal from the get go. So now that we're, you know, we got a few episodes under our, under our belt, so we can really get started uh, and producing some solid content. So thank you, Zach, for coming on. Uh, we'll be back no in a problem. couple of weeks with another episode of the EFIS. Uh, Until then, be sure to check out the rest of our shows, and we will see you guys then. All right.
Take it easy.